Uh, good afternoon. This uh, I'm Laura Ware. I'm with CCLP, and um, just wanted to give you an overview of what we hope to cover this afternoon. Um, this is a project that's become close to our heart, where we have gone and done interviews and a lot of research on what's going on in Colorado post-COVID or during COVID as well. So we hope to cover the areas on the screen, and. Um, we're, our first speaker is going to be Catherine Keegan, and I'm just going to keep emphasizing, as Tony did, that we would love to hear what's going on in your regions as it relates to the subject of what happened during COVID as well as what's happening now in, the, in uh, opportunities going forward. So please load up the chat as much as you feel, feel comfortable doing. We want to really hear from you. So... Um, um, our first guest speaker is Catherine Keegan. She is the um, director of the Future of Off, off uh, Future Work Off. Can we go to the next screen? And uh, next slide. And um, she and I, um, she has been. She has a whole plethora of activities that are on her plate. Uh, she has been connected to CCLP in many ways over the last year plus. And she and I have been working a lot on digital equity as well as future work activities with respect to this project and numerous other projects. So um, I really appreciate your being here, Catherine, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. And thanks everyone for being here today. I'm so excited to be able to see the, the presentation and to hear more about this report that I've heard so much about and that has already in, informed the work I've been doing with CCLP and outside of CCLP. Um, I just wanted to start off with a brief introduction of who I am. I'm the director of the Office of the Future of Work, as Laura said, um, with the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment. And you know, when we've been really thinking about what the future of work means, we've been thinking a lot about how um, globalization, demographic shifts, market forces, and technological advances are really shaping the work we do, who does that work, and how we do it. And so this project has already, like I said, informed some of the direction that we've taken with the office and some of the strategies that we found as we've looked to the feedback and the interventions in, from different communities. Um, in particular, one thing we know about the future of work is that it's going to require a lot of upskilling, reskilling, and next skilling as people transition from industries, as automation and technological advances transform the work that is available. And we also know that every worker will need to be tech enabled so that they can leverage technology in their, in their work experience so that they can continue to learn and participate in daily life. And so this project has been really closely connected to that. Um, as we know, there isn't you know, a one size fits all solution to help connect people to opportunity. Um, and there isn't a one size fits all solution for the different communities that exist across the state. So the insights from this project have really been incredibly valuable and I'm excited to hear more from all of you in the chat, as Laura said. Um, I'm excited to continue to, to work with CCLP um, to use these insights to create policy and programs that help create a skilled and resilient workforce and ultimately um, see the engagement like this as incredibly valuable as we're trying to think about what the future of work looks like and how we prepare Coloradans, um, especially those have, that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and face further disruption with future of work trends. So I don't wanna get us behind already. Hopefully I covered everything, Laura, um, but I'm excited to stay on for the full hour and um, would love to hear what you all are doing and um, connect with you all on this important work. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Just uh, two quick things. One is I wanna emphasize that one of the projects Catherine is spearheading is digital equity at the state level for the uh, employment and uh, uh, CDLE. And so we'll be talking about that throughout this presentation. And I also wanted to encourage everyone to uh, to identify yourself if you're on the presentation and your organization. And also if you're from another region of the state, if you could share that with us, because like we said earlier, we're very interested in um, all parts of the state. So um, Charlie, I'll turn it over to you. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Laura. And thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Um, 
So now I'd like to give a, a brief overview of the project for those who aren't familiar with it or haven't heard us speak before about this project. Um, we began it back in the spring of last year, so spring of 2020, um, when, you know, in sort of the, the peak of, of COVID um, uh, impacts, and it was funded by the ECMC Foundation out of Los Angeles. So we're very thankful and appreciative that you know, ECMCF um, allowed us to do this work uh, and research. Um, for the project, we wanted to understand um, the experiences of unemployed Coloradans during and throughout the pandemic, as well as you know, what sort of the changes and shifts that we saw in Colorado's job market and, and economy um, mean in terms of you know, the future of, uh, or future prospects for, for reemployment for, for folks who are displaced as a result of the pandemic. Um, for the project, we conducted both quantitative and qualitative research. Our quantitative research focused uh, a lot on looking at different workforce and labor market and economic statistics uh, and metrics and indicators, while the qualitative research was focused on uh, a number of key uh, stakeholder interviews with, with stakeholders across the state um, from a range of different sectors related to workforce development, training, and adult education. So we've got folks, you know, both from the public sector, from the state, as well as folks working in you know, more community-based or grassroots organizations or, or more um, social service-oriented organizations that you know, typically interface with folks who, who are unemployed, um, but particularly during COVID. Um, so our interviews also included a focus group with unemployed Coloradans, so we were able to capture some perspectives of folks who had direct experience with unemployment during the pandemic. So, um, so the results um, of, of our, our findings and our, and, our, and our studies will be published in a final report. So we expect that report to be completed um, by mid-July. Um, so we're still in the process of compiling that. Um, and I just wanna stress that this presentation is just a, a preview, a sort of a snippet of, of all of the findings and recommendations that are included in the report. You know, there's a lot more than we have time to talk about today. So we're just hoping, you know, we're just sort of giving the highlights and hoping um, that you know you all will be you know enticed and interested in, in looking back at the report when it is released and as well you know as, as Laura and others have mentioned we really hope to um, incorporate a lot of the feedback and comments that we hear from you all today into that final report so we really do um, look at this as an opportunity to help shape sort of the, that final outcome of the report. So for, for our partners, I, we wanted to, uh, we have a lot of stakeholders that we are including in the report and in all of the content of the report, but we wanted to really highlight that uh, we work very closely with these different departments of the Department of Labor. So uh, Office of Future Work, Catherine, you've already gotten to kind of mention a little bit about your work, the, the giant work of the future work, um, the, the Rural Workforce Consortium, which you're going to hear from short, shortly from Clark Becker. And then I really also want to recognize the eight workforce areas that we, um, or the nine workforce areas that we're spotlighting in the report and their directors and some of their staff and their partners, because they were definitely um, important to giving us lots of qualitative and, and quantitative content. Um, and then also along the way, we did uh, interview of 53 groups of people. So just wanna recognize that as well as two focus groups of people who've been experiencing unemployment and re having challenges to re re-enter the workforce. And then the Skills to Compete Coalition, which is where um, this project kind of emerged from originally, and it's the Colorado branch of the National Skills Coalition. Our colleague Shar is the, the lead staff and the direct connection to the National Skills uh, Coalition, which has been doing lots of national advocacy around um, legislation that's percolating along. And then the Support Services Committee, which has a very diverse representation as as does the skills to compete coalition but the, the binding factor is trying to advocate for better um, and diverse opportunities in the areas of adult education skills training of all types apprenticeships and work work that is meaningful and uh, and able to support someone's vocational goals so that those are our partners and a big thank you to all of you Yeah, so as Laura mentioned, um, you know, we were looking at uh, specifically you know, nine different regions um, in the state. Um, we did this because we know that economic conditions in our state vary region to region and that most times uh, statewide statistics mask this variation. So it can be very hard to discern sort of how 
economic conditions are differ, different in different parts of the state if we're just looking at the statewide trends. Um, so, you know, we chose these, these nine regions here on the map, and these are based on the workforce development areas and sub areas that are part of the workforce, state's workforce development system. Um, and we, you know, wanted to look specifically at how, you know, the economic effects of COVID-19 differed um, in these different regions. Um, and so just to give some orientation to these regions, I um, provided some statistics on the slide, some metrics, you know, sort of across a range of different types of socioeconomic indicators, just to give a sense of how these regions are similar or different from one another. Um, we also were sure to target um, our stakeholder interviews so that we were including you know, different perspectives um, from you know, folks working in these regions to, to sort of complement the, the quantitative data that we collected on these different regions. So now um, I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, Clark Becker, who will give us uh, an overview of the experiences of rural Colorado and how that differed from urban parts of our state over the past year and a half or so. Um, as well, you know, he'll speak to some of the, the outlook for economic recovery and growth moving forward in rural parts of the state. Um, for those who don't know, and as Laura already mentioned, uh, just to reiterate, Clark is the director of the Colorado Workforce Rural Consortium. And he oversees workforce development areas that represent 51 of our 64 counties in Colorado, so the majority of our land area as a state. Um, in addition to this, Clark has served as an elected official in multiple local governments in rural parts of Colorado, uh, which I think adds a unique perspective to his tremendous understanding of rural Colorado and the challenges and opportunities facing rural communities in our states. Um, Laura, and I, Laura and I always come away from our conversations with Clark, having learned something new or you know, seeing uh, you know, an issue or topic from a different perspective we hadn't considered before. So we're very excited and appreciative that he was able to join us today. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Clark. Wow, thank you, Charlie, I appreciate that. And um, uh, my parents would be really pleased with that introduction, but I do appreciate it. I, all to and it. You, get, you guys know that any chance I get to uh, talk about rural Colorado, I'm all over it. So uh, I, I do appreciate that. And on top of that, we. Well, the 51 county, counties that we do cover, we've got 27 workforce centers in 27 different counties. So that means we have 24 counties that do not have a workforce present. So, but I've been blessed to work in rural Colorado for over 20 years. And, and actually I understand, Laura, you indicated that maybe a lot of our team from the rural consortium could be on this call. So as, uh, as you have a chance to respond or correct or add to the, the specifics of what's going on in your particular areas, we'll welcome those that feedback. I know they're looking for that kind of thing. But you know, I am often asked, what, how do you define rural? Uh, maybe not as often as I wish I were asked, but I think USDA Rural Development uh, has, you know, five some different definitions depending on the program. And in you know, the Rural Cabinet Work Group that's, that's really focused on trying to help rural Colorado, they look at anything that's outside the front range. That's defensible, I get it. Uh, sometimes it's anything less than 50,000. But about 15 years ago or so, I got to, I, did, I was doing some work with Elizabeth Garner and her uh, team at the State Demography Office and kind of evaluated with the data that she had at the time. And I came up and I'll, uh, very quickly, I, at some time maybe we'll show you the map, uh, but in that map, what I identified were 42 counties of our 64 counties that were defensively rural Colorado. Now I will say that of our 64 counties, I believe that there are only two counties that do not have a rural component. And that would be the city and county of Denver and the city and county of Broomfield. Uh, but other than that, you know, you've got Estes Park and Larimer County, you got Calhan and El Paso County. So you get my point. But of those 42 counties in, that I consider rural, 24 of those have a population of six or fewer people per square mile. And 11 of those 24 have two or fewer people per square mile. And really what that points to is lack of human capacity or challenges in human capacity. And I will say that a lot of those counties that have two or fewer people per square mile, they're really just fine with that. They, they don't have an issue with, with, uh, with those, that population. But I also look at, there's about a dozen counties that I've identified that I refer to as ag urban or micropolitan. Those are counties like a Montrose County, Weld County, Mesa County, that have a very rural presence about them, but also an urban personality to it all. So, and as a matter of fact, earlier today, I was on a, a meeting with an update on our census data. So I intend to sit down and work with that data and see if my numbers are still where they were 15 years ago. And I submit that I'm probably still pretty close. 
But there's one other thing significant to what's going on in rural Colorado that I often tell the story. And that is that 59 out of our 100 Colorado state legislators has zip codes in the greater Denver area. Now with a live crowd, I could tell this joke and it would be better, but uh, the fact remains, the good news is you'll never get 51 of them to agree on anything. So that's the good news. But seriously, if you add Colorado Springs to Fort Collins into that mix, nearly 80% of our state legislature is front range urban Colorado. I say that because that just points to the critical need for a good working relationship between urban and rural interests. And I champion Laura and Charlie and what you're trying to do to help people understand what's going on out there. So what are some of the key points? Because I know we want to get into some other things. You know, what has the pandemic really, really taught us? We are a workforce system, no disrespect, but we are not the unemployment insurance division. And I'm personally extremely proud, as you might pick up here, of our team, because during the height of the pandemic, we really, our team just stepped up in an amazing way to help the people that needed that kind of help right then. And I'm so proud of that. But now, as Catherine pointed out, now we're getting back to what we want to focus on, and that is the reskilling, the upskilling, and in some cases, the next skilling. One of the things I know about rural Colorado is we're very resilient and we look out for each other. You know, so whether it's a flood or a tornado or a fire or a pandemic, you know, we pretty much rural Colorado, and I think probably rural America, we pick ourselves up and let's get to work. And that's our mentality. So the challenges that I know we're going to talk a little bit more later and that you've already touched on a little bit here today, I think the biggest challenges that we have, certainly we have a lot of people that are out of work. And my team has heard me say on many occasions that if business isn't hiring, there's nothing we can do to help a job seeker in our workforce system. So we have got to have a great partnership with our business community. Businesses are hiring, but we have some challenges of the people that are out of work. And some of those challenges are because of lack of housing, daycare, you hear about those things. And of course, it's already been mentioned, broadband capacity and connectivity. I will have to say personally, I think the measure that's used to determine if a community has adequate broadband Frankly, in my opinion, it's not realistic, but I'm not really smart enough, but I keep challenging that and how they look at what really makes a community have broadband connectivity. But as Laura and I have talked about on many occasions, uh, just because you have the connectivity doesn't mean you know what to do with it. And so digital literacy is another uh, concern that I have for so many of our parts of, of rural Colorado, but I think there's significant impacts with that in urban Colorado. The biggest, one of the big challenges that worries me for our folks in rural Colorado is the global economy of the 21st century really puts many of our rural communities at great risk. So we need to work towards trying to help them upskill and, and improve in that. So connectivity would be that biggest thing. Uh, Catherine and I have had, and she's very engaged with the remote work opportunities. Uh, and such, uh, but you know, when you talk about housing, the housing issues that are in Steamboat Springs, Colorado and the housing issues that are in La Junta, Colorado are two different conversations. So uh, Charlie, you already pointed out, you got the different regions because you got a lot of different ways to look at it. So uh, as we look at this and, and, and dig down deeper into what are some of those ways that we can help these communities move forward into a pr prosperous future so that they're thriving uh, not just surviving, looking forward to that. So hopefully that's a good little intro and we'll look forward to continued comments and if I can answer any questions going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Clark, uh, for that overview. Um, so now, um, you know, jumping off from, from, that, from that conversation, I'd like to look specifically at two different rural regions of the states. Um, and we chose these regions both because they had the highest unemployment rate and the lowest unemployment rate in April 2020, which was sort of the peak of unemployment or, uh, during the pandemic. Um, but before we dive into these regions, I wanted to first ask you all to be thinking about you know, the first question that we're going to be you know, asking out to the group, which is you know, to share your experiences over the past 15 months in your region. Um, you know, or you know, from the perspective of your organization and agency and, and feel free to include 
um, some responses or some thoughts on that in the chat, um, and we'll plan to share those out in a couple slides here. So thank you for, for participating and sharing your thoughts in that way. Um, so first, we'll look at the rural resort region, and, and we included maps for each of these regions um, just to help orient folks to see where, you know, where in the state we're talking about. Um, so this region is in the northwest part of the state. Um, as we can see, it includes, you know, many of our, our state's uh, mountain resort communities and, and mountain, you know, ski resorts like Vail, Aspen, and Breckenridge. Um, the region is located along the I-70 corridor, which is that thick gold line that runs east to west. Um, and so, you know, that's a major transportation corridor, not only for tourists, but also for logistics and other sort of shipping and, and transportation related industries. Um, the dotted areas of the map represent some type of public lands, forest service, BLM, et cetera. Um, you can see that those are, you know, very, you know, prominent in this region and sort of speaks to the, the orientation of the economy towards tourism and outdoor recreation. Um, so now taking a look at some data points, um, I'm not going to go through all of these just for time purposes, but, you know, I encourage you all to look at these. Um, you know, some, some points I will call out. Um, first, you know, if we look at educational attainment, um, you know, that's looking at the population 25 and up. Um, in 2019, it had a very similar share of folks with, uh, or residents with a bachelor's degree and up. Um, and, you know, the educational attainment shares or distributions sort of align closely with those of the state. Um, the next thing I'll draw your attention to is the, is the pie chart in the upper right hand corner of the slide, um, showing the distribution of employment by different economic sectors. I think what jumps out here is the fact that you know, the accommodation and food services sector accounts for nearly one in four or accounted for nearly one in four um, jobs in this region uh, back in 2019. And it was closely followed by retail trade and arts, entertainment and recreation, which are both um, tend to be sort of tourism focused industries. Um, you know, second or third, I should say, um, Looking at the unemployment rate trends um, going back, you know, two years from December 2019, um, we can see that, you know, it's trended to, to be or tended to be lower than the statewide unemployment rate. However, there are periods um, where we see some spikes in unemployment, and these are typically, you know, in the fall and spring seasons, which is fairly normal to see in these types of communities that are oriented towards, you know, the a summer and winter tourism season. And I think it's important to keep this in mind when we look at sort of the, the initial impacts of COVID-19 because it sort of aligns with um, one of these spikes, um, um, which we'll see in a second here. Um, so now looking at economic changes um, between February and April of 2020, um, we can see that nearly four in 10 jobs that were lost in this region over this period were in the accommodation food services sector, um, followed by the arts, entertainment and recreation sectors. And together these accounted for over 60% of the jobs lost which was a far greater share um, uh, compared to the state as a whole. You know, in total, we can see that, you know, the decline between uh, February and April in employment, it was about 30% in this region, which was, you know, a much, much greater than we saw as a state as a whole, about 15.4% for the state. Um, you know, when, as a result, unemployment increased from 2.3% in February to 20.7% in April. Although, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of this, um, or a lot of this, I believe, was mag uh, you know, magnified, exacerbated by um, some seasonal trends that you know, occur in this, in this region anyway, certainly far greater than they would have been or normally would have been. Um, but you know, we have seen some recovery and reduction in unemployment and, re and gains in employment in this, sec in this region um, over the summer of 2020. Um, so now we'll take a look at the um, Eastern region. Um, this region saw the lowest unemployment rate in uh, April, 2020. Um, uh, and so looking at the map, we can see that it's a very large region of our state and it covers a, you know, a many, many counties. Um, it's you know, almost the entire Northeast corner of Colorado. Um, you can see it's very, you know, as Clark mentioned, you know, as is true in most of rural Colorado, it's very sparsely populated uh, with very low population densities. Um, the communities and towns that are in this region tend to be located along major transportation corridors. Um, and the economy is oriented much more towards agriculture than it was in the, or than it is in the rural resort region. I think we can really see, um, you know, this orientation towards, you know, non sort of tourism related sectors, you know, in, in comparison or in contrast to the rural resort region when we look at the employment by sector. Um, you know, here we can see manufacturing in 2020 or 2019 uh, was the largest sector, uh, accounting for 12.5% of employment in this region. However, you know, employment was also fairly equally distributed across the next five or the next four uh, 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 sectors in terms of size. I'm looking at the unemployment rate. Unemployment uh, tends to be lower in this part of the state than in, in the state as a whole. 
although it, it closely follows the trends, um, uh, unemployment trends you know, that we see in the state. So it increases when it increases in the state and decreases. Um, again, you know, drawing your attention to educational attainment, um, you know, lower levels of educational attainment in general among the population 25 and up in this region compared to the state as a whole, you know, about 23.2% with bachelor's degree compared to 41.7% for the state as a whole. In contrast, you know, uh, work, you know, Coloradans living in this region, um, you know, 31%, 31.4% had a high school diploma, um, and 11.3 had had no high school education at all, which is greater than than for the state as a whole. And again, looking sort of specifically at you know, initial COVID impacts, uh, we can see that nearly half the jobs lost in this region, unlike in the previous region, were in the educational services sector. So that includes both private and public educational institutions, um, both for-profit and non-profit. So down from you know, an elementary school up until you know, college or university um, and anything in between. Um, accommodation and food services accounted for the next largest sector in terms of job losses. However, it was much smaller than the share of job losses in the scene in the state as a whole, and certainly you know, far less than, and than in the world resort region. Um, Total uh, losses of employment between February 2020 and April 2020 was just 8.3% in the Eastern region compared to 15.4% in the state as a whole. You know, and as a result of this, you know, unemployment increased um, from 2.4% to 5.7% over this period. So now we'll quickly take a look at the, um, oh, and sorry, I meant to pause there, Laura, and see if you have any other input to, to provide from our, from our research, our, from our qualitative uh, research. I think that, um, I'll, I'll give a prompt for people when the report comes out to, to read because we did get a lot of really interesting uh, day in life information about what's going on in these two regions. But a couple of things that just kind of came to mind um, that add on to first the rural resorts was how, how much they were impacted not only by the jobs and um, uh, the different ways that um, recreation was impacted through COVID, but they were also impacted through by the fire season in a way I hadn't expected to hear about, not only because obviously of damage and loss to, to hotels and homes and jobs and the economy, but um, the day we were interviewing them, they were actually heading up to get a lot of unemployment applications from people who had lost their homes who were working remotely. So I think there's just this breadth of impact that's spread across the entire um, state. And then another anecdotal thing, which again is a, a much more elongated in the report for the Eastern region, I think the thing that was really interesting is to hear um, how different refugee communities are impacted up there and how different um, community organizations like Will and others, along with the workforce uh, staff, are really um, tasked with trying to help them redefine their work pathways as um, different manufacturing plants and some of the prisons and other places where they had work that was pretty sustained for a long time were impacted, not only because of COVID, but greatly because of that. So. We can keep going. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Laura. Um, so now let's turn to you know just a quick snapshot of, of what's been happening over the past year or so in different parts of the state. And so for this um, next set of slides, we'll be looking specifically at the Arapahoe Douglas region and the Pueblo region. Um, both are located within you know metropolitan statistical areas. You know, going back to what Clark was mentioning about how do you define rural. Um, you know, technically, uh, or at least in the eyes of the you know U.S. Census Bureau, Pueblo is also a, a rural area, and so um, you know we, we thought it'd be interesting to sort of compare and contrast the experiences of two rural areas that aren't you know the Denver area or Denver County, um, and both are you know located along the I-25 Front Range Urban Corridor of our state, and so you know are fairly linked by I-25 at least uh, you know that transportation corridor. Um, so looking first at the Arapahoe Douglas region, we can see that this region you know, is located in the southeast portion of the Denver metro area. I-25 is a major transportation corridor running through this region, um, connecting Denver to Colorado Springs. And you know, both counties in this region, I think, you know, again, referencing, <laughs> going back to what Clark was, talk, was speaking about, you know, include sort of a variety of different community types. And, you know, we can see you know, sort of really urban areas you know, around Aurora and, and closer to Denver. Um, you know, transitioning out to suburban areas, um, and, and then as well some so very low densities, more rural parts. So 
you know, sort of a breadth of, of different types of communities included in, in both of these, in, or in both of these counties that make up this region. Now looking at um, trends over the course of 2020 and then in the beginning parts of 2021, um, we can see that, you know, changes in employment in this region largely tracks with that of the state as a whole. So no, you know, no real differences there um, when we're looking at this region in particular. Um, it still has less employment um, as of April 2021 than in February 2020. And so, you know, still some, some uh, room for, you know, the recovery in this, in this uh, region is still ongoing. Um, unemployment rates similarly have tracked fairly closely with that of the state, you know, increasing initially at the beginning of 2020 um, before declining pretty sharply during the, the first couple of summer months and then um, you know, leveling off around 6% throughout the rest of 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, one thing that we also wanted to include in this conversation was you know, um, unemployment insurance and just how you know, changes in unemployment insurance continued claims that were filed um, sort of you know, differed across different regions of our state. Um, so we can see in the solid line is sort of representing the, the relative um, percent change in, um, or the relative change in, um, in the number of people filing unemployment and continued unemployment insurance claims since um, March 7th, 2020. Um, so we can see, you know, a, a tremendous increase both in, in this region as well as in the state as a whole um, in the initial weeks of the pandemic, you know, sort of peaking around um, the beginning of May um, before tapering down and, let, and, and you know, decreasing throughout much of the, the summer and, and fall of 2020 um, before seeing some increase again um, towards the end of 2020. And you can see that generally, you know, the number of you know, the relative increase has been greater in the Arapahoe Douglas region than in the state as, as a whole. However, you know, sort of that difference in, in the relative magnitude sort of has been decreasing um, throughout the course of 2020. Now looking at Pueblo, um, you know, again, a similar region that sort of has characteristics of both an urban and rural region. I mean, you've got the city of Pueblo itself in the center um, and then areas in Pueblo County um, that are more sparsely populated, more rural in character. Um, you know, again, this is another region that's located along the I-25 corridor. This is you know, much further south than the previous one, um, you know, sort of located in between Colorado Springs and, and the New Mexico border. So as with the Arapahoe Douglas region, you know, trends in this um, region also largely followed the statewide trends. However, there, was, there were some notable differences. Um, you know, the first, I think, uh, when we look at employment trends, um, you know, employment growth, um, or this region was you know, regaining employment and saw you know, strong employment growth leading up to November 2020. However, since then, you've seen sort of a, a backsliding in the recovery and some loss of employment in this region. Um, you know, we can sort of see this reflected again in, in the unemployment rates, um, you know, while initially, you know, fairly closely followed that at the states, um, you know, it began to increase during July 2020, um, this increase sort of lasted throughout the end of, end of 2020 before, um, you know, declining again um, in, the, in the first, you know, four months of, of 2021. Um, Similarly, you know, there wasn't the same, you know, spike in unemployment insurance claims, um, or at least the magnitude of increase in unemployment insurance claims, as we saw in the state or in the Arapahoe Douglas region. However, you know, still a pretty, you know, notable increase relative to where um, this region was at as of, um, you know, March 7th, 2020. Um, you can see that, you know, the, the level or the number of, of people, uh, the increase in, in, in unemployment insurance claims, continued claims that have been filed, has been fairly steady throughout um, this period in this region. Um, you know, whereas the state has sort of seen a decline, this region has sort of seen sort of a, a steady level, if not a, you know, a slight increase towards the end of 2020. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, in both of these regions, I think you know, the takeaway is, and, and is, is the case throughout many regions in the state, is that you know, recovery efforts are still ongoing. And you know, while some counties individually or some regions may be you know, fully recovered, that there's still a lot of gains to be made um, to return back to our February 2020 levels of employment. You know, so now I'd like to turn it back over to Laura to, to add some qualitative um, snippets mm -hmm. from, from our interviews. Um, well, these two regions are, are both fascinating and there's a, so much going on in all the regions, but this one um, in the Rappahoe Douglas, I think a couple of things that a lot of you can probably relate to is that um, uh, one of the challenges that occurred during COVID was uh, limited uh, amounts of work-based learning opportunities or internships that people could try. So those 
poor people who were uh, forced out of work, whether it's from the restaurant and hospitality world or recreation or from the airport or those kinds of jobs. Um, they had a hard time uh, trying to get back into the workforce um, for one reason, because work-based learning has been such a, a positive tool for trying out a new opportunity and being tried out by the employer and hopefully making a match. However, um, I heard recently from uh, one of the, the uh, one of the main um, managers at AD Works at Arapaho Douglas Workforce that. Uh, their work, their work based learning has really picked up again, and they have these amazing um, internships now set up with different, different chamber of commerces in those two counties. Um, and just as a, a core thing, because I made a point of asking this, um, there there is no limitation on people who have justice um, re reentry involvement or justice. Um, Justice involvement, which I thought was really cool. So uh, it, the opportunities for apprenticeships and work-based learning are really ranging hugely. And I do think I want to really spotlight the fact that so many different groups in these two counties, Rappahoe County, Douglas counties, and most of the counties are doing amazing work to offer um, non-traditional opportunities to non-native English speakers. One of the things that's come up that I heard about were healthcare workers, you know, from the refugee community who were working in tandem with healthcare workers to reach those non-native English speaking communities. And the many, um, Many examples such as that. In Pueblo, the one I'll spotlight is that there is an actual, a, a new a tech campus down there that is doing amazing partnering with the um, high school and college community to really teach tech skills um, from day one. And it was, uh, we heard a lot about that over time as well as in the upper Arkansas region. And so I think that I just wanna always be optimistic that there's amazing innovation going on at the same time. Charlie, is it me next? Yeah. Slide 21, yeah, is sorry. that the next one? There we go, sorry, we we're having a little freeze there, but yes. Back to you. Don't freeze, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so we wanted to kind of, um, hopefully you've been um, contributing some of your experiences over the 15, last 15 months as per what we brought up in the beginning. And Tony, I don't know if you're able to, to read any of the, um, the input that we've heard from people so far. Yeah, we've just gotten a couple of uh, kind of quick questions. Um, one of them was, let me pull it back up here. Uh, from uh, Catherine Carson, she asked, uh, do you have this information available by county? Yeah, so, so that's that, great. Yeah, the right. maps, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, and, and yeah, and for the most part, I think the data in the report is structured around these regions. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we fully acknowledge there's no, you know, right way to split up the, the state into different regions. And so we were really trying to align our regions with those of the state workforce development system, just since that seemed the most relevant, um, you know, system to the report or sort of statewide uh, or state sort of focus or oriented way to split up the the, um, the state um, to based on the, the topic of a report. Um, you know, we're, we do have all of this data divided up by county. And so we're happy to share, you know, anything that we do have that's county based with folks. If, if they want to reach out to us individually, you know, I'm happy to, to provide some of them materials on a county level, but um, for the most part, you know, most of the, the um, discussion about, you know, re trends are sort of based on these regions. And then we've got two questions from uh, Jeanette Hensley. Uh, one of them was, uh, what age range did you include in your study? It looks like it was 25 to 54 was the numbers that kept coming up there. Is that, was that the... Yeah, so that really depends on what data source we're looking at because it's just you know a fact a, a factor of just how the census provides a lot of that data or different government sources. And so, you know, for for a lot of the labor force data, and, and we'll, we'll provide a lot of this in background and and, and um, definitions in the report itself. But just so you know, folks are on the same page here. You know, a lot of the the workforce, you know, employment, unemployment, that sort of um, you know uh, data or metrics. Um, is looking at the population 16 and over, um, specifically the non-institutionalized civilian population 16 and over. Um, whereas, you know, educational attainment data tends to be based on population that's 25 and up. 
Um, and then some other you know, data sources um, have a different age range depending on you know, just how that data is provided by the census. And so um, it really depends on, on which group or which, which data source we're looking at. But in terms of our project, we didn't um, specifically determine an age range that we were looking at. And we were you know, you know, trying to look at, you know, be inclusive of all ages and, and different um, you know, um, uh, experiences or positions that, that folks are starting at. And the other question from uh, Jenna Hensley uh, might be might be a question for our uh, guest speakers as well. Uh, have you seen an increase of adults needing work or retraining from those who are older than fifty five? So I'll, I'll say, you know, in terms of our research, we haven't seen anything specific, but I'll let Clark and and, and Catherine maybe weigh in and see if they have any um, you know uh, anything that they can share. Uh, I have some anecdotal, but Catherine, do you have any? I think you've you've certainly worked with this. Do you have a response to that first? Yeah, happy to. And it's funny today we had a conference earlier this morning on age inclusive management practices and launched a website that employers can use to, um, in partnership with Next Fifty Initiative, the University of Iowa and Transamerica, where they're you're able to learn about age inclusive practices that employers can adopt. So I can drop a link to that in the chat if people are interested there. We know that early on in the pandemic, older workers were more likely to be um, laid off more quickly and that they um, often face longer, um, it takes longer for them to be rehired. And the longer someone is on unemployment, the less likely they are to return to the wages that they had before they left. And so we saw some of that early on. And then as we're thinking about our investments and the stimulus dollars coming out, we're encouraging targeting strategic efforts um, for specific populations that have been most impacted, like older workers. Um, Tony, I just want to spotlight one comment that is in the chat that I think is worth mentioning. One is um, that women have left, I think, Charlie, you mentioned this, but women have left the workforce so much faster for uh, childcare reasons and that kind of thing. And um, uh, that, I think a lot of the community is struggling to match, a lot of the service providers are struggling to match the, the abilities of the workers who need to have an income and to start earning an income at the same time as um, they get upskilled. So earning and um, upskilling at the same time is a challenge for almost every service provider I've talked to of the 52, so. Um, and then specifically also for women. So that's just one comment that's in the chat. And if you all have other comments, really appreciate getting that, that input as we keep going. Yeah, I would just, I would oh, just if I could, no, I'd just simply quick, quickly yeah. add that I think there's on two sides of that. Uh, and certainly we've, uh, there is an op a lot of opportunity for your older worker. Uh, however, what we're hearing, and I haven't seen, I don't think Catherine, you have either any hard data that says that, some of the older workers that either were laid off or their job situation changed have evaluated and said, you know what, maybe I will retire. And so they're, they're not going back into the workforce uh, and, in, and in some cases trying to reskill people in that, in that older age that, that maybe they, as I think Catherine said, and it's been mentioned, I don't wanna go back to doing what I did before, but I'm not sure I wanna start over. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic Certainly there is motivation to attract the 50 plus worker. Uh, some people are 60 plus, I just, a side note. But, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. But yeah, there is an issue with, with the older worker getting back to work, but I don't see a reticence to, uh, to bringing them back to work. Great, well, thank you, Clark. Yeah, and, and just in the interest of time, folks, I just wanna move us along. We'll have more opportunity for Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation. We just have a couple more slides to get through before that. Um, so, you know, just wrapping up, I think sort of the, the data portion of, of, our, of our presentation, um, I just wanted to, you know, take a quick look at sort of where we think the economy might be headed in the next 10 years um, in terms of employment in different occupations. Um, so the Bureau of Labor Statistics in cooperation with different state labor and employment departments like CDLE um, prepares employment projections for different occupations um, and sectors of the economy. You know, on the chart here, we can see in the, in the dark blue bars what that baseline projection was for the 2019 to 2029 period, which is the most recent projection we have. Um, as you'll notice, it doesn't include, you know, the, the changes that we experienced during COVID-19. It sort of tends to be a weakness of these projections that, you know, 
typically look backwards to sort of make projections about what is going to happen moving forwards. Um, it's really hard for them to account for sort of these unexpected changes, which you know none of us were expecting COVID-19 back in 2019. So you know it's no fault of theirs, but um, you know, just a challenge with with doing these types of projections. Um, um, and you know, as you know, because they didn't, you know, they were released before the, the full effects of COVID-19 could be incorporated. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics did release, you know, two different scenarios that were looking at how, um, you know, some trends or changes that we saw as a result of the pandemic in terms of an increase in teleworking or remote working, um, an increase uh, of automation and sort of moving, you know, trying to move services online as much as possible, as well as sort of a decrease in in in-person events. Um, in, in travel and in the, that sort of thing, um, you know, how that would affect and what sort of spillover effects that those could have in, throughout the rest of the economy. And so, um, you know, the, the, the different scenarios are just different sort of magnitudes of those changes. You know, one is sort of assuming a moderate change, the other a more strong change. Um, and so we can sort of begin to see, you know, not necessarily, you know, exact predictions. You know, I want to, you know, caution folks that these are not meant to be sort of, you know, exact predictions of where we'll be at 2020, you know, by 2029. Um, but I think they do serve uh, a purpose in terms of showing us which, which sectors or which occupations in our economy um, could be the most vulnerable or are the most vulnerable if some of these trends that we saw, you know, accelerate during the pandemic, if they continue moving forward into the future, which by every indication that we have, it, it appears as though they will, although perhaps probably not at the same magnitude as we experienced over the past year and a half. Um, and so what we do see from looking at this, this occupational projection data is that, um, you know, in terms of which, which sector, which occupations will see increased um, rates of growth as a result of some of the trends like teleworking, automation, et cetera, are in the computer and mathematical occupations, as well as the life, physical, and social science occupations. Um, so these are pretty, you know, relatively high skilled, um, you know, um, um, uh, occupations for uh, uh, in our state. Um, uh, in contrast, you know, occupations that are likely to see reduced levels of employment growth um, over the next, you know, into the future include the, the food preparation and serving related occupations. So that's, you know, waiters and waitresses, cooks, et cetera, um, sales and related. So, you know, folks working as in sales and retail, um, th those sorts of occupations, as well as office and administrative support. And, you know, I think a lot of these reflect, you know, just general changes, you know, that 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 could occur if, you know, we see uh, an increased demand for office space, you know, less business travel, more remote work, and those sorts of things. And, you know, again, I think they're just instructive and sort of help us to, to, to see sort of, you know, where, you know, some occupations uh, may not have as bright of an outlook, you know, moving forward into the future, as we initially thought, or, you know, as we might have hoped they would, um, you know, at the outset of the pandemic or before the pandemic, I should say. Um, and so I think it's, yeah, just, again, I think it also highlights the need to provide some pathways um, that help folks who are working in these relatively low-skilled occupations to be able to transition to the more high-skilled occupations that we predict will be more in demand in the future. And I'm going to turn it over to Laura now to talk about some of the opportunities of interest that we um, picked up through our, our, our different interviews. Yeah. I'm gonna um, suggest that I, I just want to highlight uh, just to read these back. But I think that um, they're all important and they all resonate with a lot of you. I think that what we all, what we learned in every interview almost is that um, broadband and connectivity, as well as willingness to be connected and the affordability, as Clark you brought up many times, and then. Um, um, I'm going to point a phrase from, a, from my uh, supervisor, Shar. We need apprenticeships that create a pathway to the pathway. It's not just a single apprenticeship. It's, it's pre-apprenticeships that lead people to be able to access all the opportunities that Charlie just described. And then thirdly, the thing that we learned over and over, which was awesomely emphatic and interesting, is that people want to stay at home. It's easier to do provided home childcare than to try and arrange childcare and afford it. And so that was a, those are interesting observations, but let's move to the next one. Cause we, I definitely want to make sure that we um, kind of talk about um, any examples that um, uh, some of the promising practices. Um, I think all of you know that the apprenticeship office that was just, um, um, passed by the state is a 
has a lot of possibilities in terms of creating the, the pathways that we were talking about. And a lot of you on the call and Clark and Catherine and others are involved in the conversation about how they can be provided to create diverse opportunities. And I did see a chat um, from Rich Parr asking about remote <clears throat> remote work futures. And I think that this is one of the ones that, um, that Catherine and I have talked about a lot is how do you create apprenticeships in learning remote work skills, digital skills, digital equity access, and then become eligible for remote work opportunities. So, and, but it's also starting at the, the place that needs, where it needs to start, not with a basic understanding of computers for a lot of people. Um, and um, again, what Catherine's doing as a statewide initiative is a really wonderful practice. Um, I think I, I got this from one of my interviews with a colleague, creating municipal broadband opportunities systems that, um, this is pretty advanced, but fiber service to not only each community or along the I-70 corridor, but into each home. Um, that's aspirational, but I think it needs to be a conversation all the time. Um, look in, and then I already talked about opportunities of partnering with your boards, um, whether it's a workforce board or your own boards and chambers to create apprenticeships and work-based learning opportunities. And can we go to the, the next one? Um, I already talked about pathway to the pathway. That's our little buzz work. Um, and um, one of the things that I've, uh, we've been working on, um, Catherine and others, are to look at a, a statewide digital coaching system so that all the different activities that are going on in each region to create ways to support people, whether it's elderly people or people who have never touched a computer, to look, look at how it's going to work to create a statewide coaching system that has flexibility and responsive abil abilities, in, including being mobile. And um, lastly, at the local level, I think um, there's a there's some movement in different places to create training and work opportunities in human service sectors, including obviously early childhood, home health aid, you know, to credentialize those, as well as to create the training of all at all levels that's needed to be effective, including for those people who never thought about doing that work before, but would be really good at it and want to try it. And then lastly, um, uh, healthcare of all that we learned through the healthcare uh, pandemic, there's just so many different ways of looking at healthcare opportunity on the road. So there's any other promising practices in our report. This is a, just a sample. Um, Charlie, do you wanna kind of do this together? I'm gonna, we sound like a broken record, but digital equity as Clark said at the beginning um, is the number one challenge that we heard about facing all the workforce areas, whether it's um, rural or um, urban. The challenges are different in some cases, but that they're, they're still universal. Charlie, do you wanna yeah. tap yeah. in yeah. there? Another one, another one we, we were discussing was, you know, creating a position at the state, you know, perhaps housed in CDLE. Um, that would assist different workforce regions, workforce regions in the state to identify and obtain funding from a diverse set of sources. Um, you know, one thing I think that we heard in our conversations with different workforce regions was that you know they were limited in how they could use some of the funding that is is provided to them. You know, for instance, you know there were limitations in terms of being able to purchase um, a computer, you know, equipment. Um, uh, when really that was sort of the greatest need that was facing some of the, the workforce in, the, in their region. Um, and so just, you know, having some, you know, support and, and um, 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 assistance from the state, I think would be, or we, we feel would be, you know, great help um, to, to help, um, you know, sort of braid a diverse sort of set of funding sources together, funding streams together to help, um, you know, the workforce regions in the state to, to meet the diverse needs that are facing, you know, the particular regions. Uh, or you know their you know their particular region. Um, as well, as, go ahead. No, no, go for it. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say as well. You know, I think that you know uh, there's a lot of opportunities with using the stimulus money in the American Rescue Plan or ARPA um, to 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 put towards you know targeting opportunities um, 
or targeted opportunities for displaced workers with lower skills. I think this represents sort of a huge investment into sort of our workforce and adult education system um, that we you know, haven't seen in, in you know, quite some time. Um, and so I think you know, that creates a lot of new opportunities um, and, and, and ability to be creative and, and responsive to um, different um, you know, uh, situations or different um, you know, experiences of different regions as well. And I think the last one that we wanted to really uh, highlight, is, um, and all of you have experience with this, but really uh, working with employers to, to think about how their work environments can be um, accommodated to what we learned during COVID. Uh, wage is always something that comes up, living wage, in order to be able to afford their, their daily life and um, workable benefits as well. But in our interviews, many, many of the interviewees, including um, in both focus groups we did, reported that having a schedule where they can care, take care of the private business, take care of their children or their elder parents or all their other responsibilities, not to work less hours even, but to have a schedule that is predictable and um, one so they can plan around it came up over and over. So that's another recommendation. And then, um, Charlie, do you want to go to the last one? I think it is. Yeah, so just this last slide, um, you know, we're, we'll open it up to Q&A here in a second, but I just want to you know, reiterate, <laughs> we've, we've, we've drilled this into your heads enough times, but, you know, please feel free to email any additional comments or questions to Laura or myself. And you know, we have our, our email addresses up here and we'll be sure to send out this presentation along with our email addresses to, to all the, the participants in this, in this webinar, um, just so you have that as a resource, you know, feel free if there were things you weren't able to share in the chat, if there are, you know, things that pop up, you know, between, you know, over the next week that you, you know, think you know, like would be useful for us or, you know, a question you'd like clarified, you know, we're very, you know, uh, 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 open and, and looking and hoping to be able to incorporate, you know, some feedback and, and build on um, some of you know the ideas that we presented here um, to incorporate those into our final report, um, which is again you know scheduled to be released in, you know, around mid July in 2020, so just in a couple of weeks here. Um, so we're hoping, um, yeah, you'll all be looking forward to that and be sure to to uh, take a look at that once it is released. Um, but I wanted to, to thank you all for joining us today, and, and um, I think we'll open it up to some some Q and A with the remaining time we have. Um, if you don't have time and, and you know we're we're at the end of the hour, um, you know feel free um, to to drop off. We will be recording this webinar, so if you missed the, the last little bit or can't stay for that, um, you can always go back and, and rewatch um, some of the answers to the questions that um, that we're responding to right now. So um, thank you again, and then let's open it up to Q and A. Are there is there stuff on the Q and A one, Tony? Yeah, I can. Yeah, there. I don't know if you guys can see them already or not, but uh, there are a couple of questions on there. Um, the uh, one of the questions was uh, came up when you mentioned the uh, apprenticeships and, uh, and pathway opportunities. Um, the question was, will the apprenticeship include benefits for people? Um, is that? Um, I'm not sure, Claire. Catherine, do you know um, what the general feeling or the general uh, format is for apprenticeships at this point or in the future? Well, and Catherine, unless you have more insider information than I do, Bill Dowling shared with the state directors today that that office is likely, uh, there, there are a lot of details that are going to be established yet. So we don't really know. I'm not trying to sidestep your answer. I, know, I hate it when somebody does that, but they're still working out the details of exactly what that looks like. What we do believe is that that office will create a lot more flexibility to hopefully meet some of those goals that you put in there, uh, Charlie and Laura. So uh, that's the real upside of that. It will likely be housed in the Employment Training Division office at CDLE, but even that is not uh, for certain, I don't believe. So they've they've just got those those things to cover. So. That's what we know. And as soon as we know more, we will make sure you get that information. But traditionally, they, they do include benefits, don't they, um, Catherine? Traditionally? Yeah. So, and there's a few oh. different type of apprenticeships from, you know, looking at pre-apprenticeships to industry recognized apprenticeships to registered apprenticeships that all have sort of different standards with registered apprenticeships being the most robust. But that's one of the big values is that that create those um quality jobs and pathways with, with benefits and protections. 
the excitement about this is though that the registered apprenticeships out of the feds with the DOL really are more restrictive. And so that some of the things that we'd like to see is where we could be more creative, particularly in small communities and the pre-apprenticeships are, are difficult to do with a registered apprenticeship model. So yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, real positive uh, opportunity with the apprenticeship office with the state. So that's right. I'll also just point out if uh, if anybody hasn't seen them in the chat, uh, there are a couple of links that Catherine had provided um, that uh, may also um, help to answer some of the one of the questions that had come up earlier. Um, there, there was another comment in the question and answers uh, from our our own CCLP colleague Shara Robert. Uh, she mentioned that the slides from the first two regions had gone by quickly. Uh, she thought she read across the bottom on the pie chart that more than half of adults had weak literacy or numeracy skills, even though a significant portion of the population were college graduates. Uh, so um, can you speak to that? Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess a couple a couple points to mention here. Um, so first of all, the source for this data it comes from the PIAC assessment, um, which is an assessment of adults 17 to 64, um, looking at their competencies and skill levels in literacy and numeracy. Um, and so for this, you know, in literacy in this context does not necessarily refer to the ability to read and write, but to do different tasks using words and, 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 and reading comprehension. And so it's, um, it, it's not necessarily that I'm saying, or we're not suggesting here that you know, nearly half are unable to read and write, you know, half the population in this region, um, but that, you know, um, and so the way that the PIAC uh, results are scored is they, they, they rank them on different levels. And so level one and level two, which is the, you know, the percentage that's represented here is the percentage of adults that are estimated to be sort of in level one and level two. Um, level one um, for PIAC for both numeracy and literacy is you know, generally referred to as you know, the not proficient in numeracy and literacy skills. And then level two is, um, you know, people who are approaching proficiency in numeracy and literacy skills. So it's not necessarily that you know, people don't have those skills, but that, you know, it's suggesting that, you know, half or close to half the population, um, you know, could use some, some training, some, you know, refresh on, on sort of numeracy and literacy skills um, to sort of be, um, you know, at that proficiency level, which would be level three and above. I think, it, I believe it goes to level five. Um, for the PIAC. Um, and so, yeah, definitely more context on that in the report itself, but a great question. I uh, hope that clarifies things. Tony, can I ask, are you going to be able to save the chat and send that out as part of these slides? Yeah, I, I can save all of that. I'll do that. Because there's some good links along the way. That'd be, thank you so I'll much. Any other um, comments or questions or uh, five comments from um, Clark and um, Catherine? I just saw that um, Laura, Lori Harvey had been raising her hand, so I wanted to make sure we give her a chance to. Cool. Well, um, well we're testing our skills with webinars here, so give us, <laughs> bear with us here, Lori. I, I believe I'm about to let you speak, so if not, we'll work on that, but. <laughs> Lori, Sorry. you with us. I think you're muted, Lori, if you are um, trying to speak. Oh, I can speak? There she is, yay, yeah. welcome. <clears throat> oh my gosh, I didn't know I was going to be allowed to speak. And I was just kind of raising my hand because I just was, was liking to use my um, cursor and point around the whole site, uh, not really having <laughs> a specific oh. <laughs> question. No, no. Um, but I just want to say again, what uh, tremendous work and just trying to get all of the, um, um, the interviews that you did and the focus groups in the time of, of COVID. Um, you did just such a tremendous job, um, Charlie and Laura and everyone who helped. Um, and um, I am very excited about that apprenticeship office because I think Clark, what you said about formalized apprenticeships, I just think that they don't work for everyone. And I love the pathway to pathway kind of training. I think that's going to open up uh, things for a lot of people. So great work, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Lori.
Any other questions, comments out there? You know, looks like we figured out how to let people speak. So if you'd rather speak your question, feel free to raise your hand. We'll try to get you up here. Otherwise. <laughs> Better late than never, huh? <laughs> oh dear. With our own, yeah, digital skills being developed as we speak. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Catherine, can you include that link? Uh, do you happen to have it nearby that talks about uh, digital equity and digital literacy as a um, health indicator? Yep, it's one of my go-to articles. I can drop that in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, that's such an important article. It really, it's really kind of speaks to the whole thing. We can include that in follow-up communications after the event as well. Thank you. That would be great. Seeing any other hands, Charlie? No, I'm not. So I think um, we'll wrap it up there then. Um, we don't want to keep people too much longer since we are already over time. Um, again, just want to say thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. and. and I hope it was it was useful and informative and hopefully you know generate some interest in the report once it's released and you know i'll just mention this one final time but please you know feel free to email any comments or questions to laura and myself for sure Yo, thanks so much appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it thank you thank you Catherine clark and tony and charlie is uh thank you for all the work you've done it's amazing yeah, data a lot of work yeah Thanks, guys. Okay. Be safe. Thank you. Okay. Thank See you, you soon. Thank you for joining. Yep. Thanks for okay. joining. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Bye. Bye.